Matthew 24. And we'll be reading verses 9 to 13. Matthew 24, 9 to 13. They will deliver you up to tribulate, deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Our speaker today is Brother Philip Pottinger from our sister church in Hartford. So I will give him the pulpit at this time. Good morning again, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you after so long. And we've had COVID to blame for that, I'm sure. But God is still on the throne. He is still merciful. He is still loving. And this morning, as we worship him, may our hearts tune heavenwards to know that God wants nothing more than to save us in his kingdom. And so this, the title of the message this morning is, For Heaven's Sake, Hold On. It could be a rebuke or it could be an ad admonition. You know, when your parents say, say to you, for heaven's sake, you know, it's always something negative telling you to do something positive. But this morning, I want to think this is something positive admonishing us to stand fast in our faith and, as, and keeping us in God's love as we meditate on these words. Let us bow our heads. Our Father, we open your words now and pray that your Holy Spirit will guide my tongue and that our hearts will be lifted heavenwards as we hear the words from your throne room letting us know that we should hold on no matter what we encounter because soon and very soon great will be our reward in heaven for we pray this in jesus name the title of the song is until then My heart can see when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along the trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on Until the day My eyes behold that city Until the day God calls me of earth will dim and lose their value 
if we recall, they borrowed for a fire and things of earth that cause our hearts to tremble. Remember them will only bring a smile. The soul of man is like a waiting falcon. It's destined for the sky. May that be the cry of all our hearts, that until that day God calls us home, we will endure until the end. You see, when we accepted Christ as our personal Savior from sin, it was a joyful occasion. We can all testify that we experience the newness of life, and we pledge to give up this world and all its enticement. We give up this wicked world and live in the expectation that we will live in God's holy presence when the life giver comes again. He extends to everyone the invitation to come, taste and see that the Lord is good. And he wants to save us. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8 says, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we all answered that call by giving up our former life in exchange for the life that can be found only in Jesus Christ. However, once we made that decision known to God and to man, that we follow him wherever he wills, the enemy begins a process of intimidation. Life as we know it has changed, but that change is good for us on, on behalf of Christ, but Satan does, does not like it. You see, he lost his exalted position in paradise as the covering cherub, as the angel who was, who was in the councils of the Almighty God. But he lost it when he, we are told, iniquity was found in him. And Ellen White says God gave him so many chances to repent, but he refused. And therefore, he has lost that position forever and ever. But he didn't stop there. 
In fact, he would like to see as many of us with him in hell. That's why he walks around like a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. And, to, and make no mistakes about it, he targets God's children. As a result, that makes the life of all of us as Christians a life of toil. So accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior was a wonderful experience, but there are challenges. Paul says, they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There are events in the life of every Christian that can make or break him or her. The loss of a job, the death of a loved one, enemies from dear and here and everywhere, they can make our lives challenging, to say the least. And not only that, but there are challenges that often call into question our very commitment to this path that we've taken. And I will go so far as to say, if you are not being challenged, then we must go back and examine our relationship with Christ. Because we are on Satan's territory, and therefore, it's like living in Afghanistan and call yourself an American citizen right now. First, we have to face the reality that Christianity, based on scripture, is not a popular lifestyle. Mind you, I said based on scripture because there are many Christians out there. Thousands, millions of Christians, but it's not based on, on, on scripture. There are, uh, as we can go so far as to say that there are those who believe that biblical Christianity is outdated. That it's irrelevant. I've had many conversations with, with, with individuals who say that Christianity these days does not make sense. But you and I know that as, we, as long as we follow the man Christ Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, life makes much sense. It was James who said that the world is at enmity with God. James 4 and verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the fellowship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So we can't be knitted with the world. We must be separate. In fact, right now, the, 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 council of the, the world council is looking to bring all religions together. But Jesus says, be separate. And as long as we are separate, we stand out. We are obvious. But the world does not like that. So we must live in the reality that Christianity, based on scripture, is not a popular lifestyle. And therefore, it's unnatural. It's not, it is unnatural for Christians to be, to be linked or knitted together with worldlians. And the converse is true that it is natural that the world hates those who follow Christ. And the second thing is that Paul advised Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus. Now that's the, that's the, that's the qualifier. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And therefore the things of God are foolishness to those in the world. And therefore the world is hostile to those who follow Christ. But we deal, as we deal with those challenges, it is essential to make our goal of making it to heaven a reality. And as we matriculate through life, the challenges will come to us to put our minds in uncomfortable situations. But as long as we are on the word of God and settle in our mind that God's word is true, we have nothing to fear. And so that's why I've entitled the message, For Heaven's Sake, For Heaven's Sake, Hold On. And see, what I find interesting about our lives as Christians is that the challenge we face as Christians is that we are living in this world, 
You see, when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he had to find somewhere to go. He found, he found this earth. God, gave, God allowed him to come and claim this earth. And we, as we are born into this world, we're born in Satan's territory. But as we change our allegiance to Christ, we're still here. We are still on Satan's territory. But we are asked, we, we are required to live as if we are on Jesus' side. That's a challenge for all of us. And that's what makes a Christian experience a life of endurance. And we don't sail on flowery beds of ease. But we still have to do it with joy and peace in our hearts. You see the, 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 the conflict? We're on God's side in Satan's territory. That means we are targets of spiritual wickedness in high places. And Satan places the crosshairs of his weapon on our lives and he shoots his fiery darts with wanton disregard for our safety, for our lives. And it's not because we did anything to him. But it's because we love Jesus. It's because we have Jesus in our hearts and Satan hates that. You notice those who are, who are not al aligned with Christ, they, their lives seems wonderful, if I must say that. But like David, we won't understand the, the, what, what their lives are until we go into the house of God, until we are under the banner of Prince Emmanuel. When we dedicate our lives to God, Satan turns up the heat and we begin to experience things that are meant for our destruction. Just because we declare Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing else. In our scripture today, we must understand it in proper context. It must be understood that as followers of Christ, we will experience things that are unique to the Christian. Why? Because these experiences reveal the sinfulness of this evil world we live in. And they hate that. When you and I stand up for righteousness, it reveals to those who don't follow Christ that their lives are not on par with what God says. And that's why it's, it is important that you and I live the, right, the life that Jesus came to give us here and now. Not when we get to heaven. In other words, right now we're preparing our characters for the life to come. And while we're doing so, we will experience things that make our lives miserable. What a paradox. That's why Paul says all things work together for good to those, to those who love God. All things, the good things and the bad things work together for good. So how do we def define endurance? There are two definitions. No, number one says to continue in the same state. You keep moving without changing. But I like the second one. It says to remain under, uh, rather, remain firm under suffering or misfortune without yielding. To remain firm without giving in to the temptations. Life will be difficult, but you, you are still a follower of Christ. So let me ask, what is it that we must endure? Let me hasten though to acknowledge that the struggle to live for God in this world is real. It is, there is, it's not, a, it's not a, a hypothetical, it's real. And you and I must come to that realization early on in our Christian experience. See, when I, I, I got baptized when I was 16, and I thought after baptism, I'm going to have life as easy as, I, as it can, because I've, I've changed my life to God's kingdom, so I must have everything I want. But I just, I realized that it was then devil turned up the heat. 
So it's real. Jesus forewarned his disciples by telling them in Matthew 24 and verse 9 that they will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you. Not only that, you will be hated by all nations. That can't be a good thing. To be hated by all nations. To be targets of their rage. But I like what 1 John 1, uh, 3 and verse 13 says. It says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. They're supposed to do that. So I'd like to discuss a few things that you and I must endure as Christians. The first one I'd like to, 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 to bring to your attention is the concept of deception. When Jesus was about to wrap up his earthly ministry, the disciples came to him and asked him an important question. They wanted to know how long will they have to wait until he, come, he came back. And he turned to them and he said to them something that didn't really apply in their time. He said to them, do not, well, let me read that for you. Matthew 24 and verses 3 and 4. It says, and he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered them and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. And again in verse 11, he said the same thing. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. So it tells me that deception was going to be a big deal in the last days. So Jesus said to them, be careful because there are deceivers out there. In reality, Jesus was talking to the disciples, but he really was addressing those who would be in his kingdom or in relationship with him toward the end of time. Because if you, you don't have to look very far to see that deception is the hallmark of all religions these days. Everything, well, let me put it this way, 95% of what religious people believe in our society today is based on human traditions, not biblical teachings. And so Jesus said to his disciples, and he says the same thing to you and me, be careful because they are deceivers. They are on the devil's side and they are willing and ready to deceive. As Bible-believing Christians, you and I must wade through a mountain of false teachings in order to get to truth. This includes a day of worship. You tell somebody you're a Seventh-day Adventist, I've had that question. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, what is that? Of course, that becomes an opportunity to say, I worship on the seventh day of the week. And then the, the answer would be, really? But everybody worships on Sunday. Why? Because there's deception in the world. The state of the dead. People are thinking that once their loved one is dead, they're in heaven looking down on them. You know what's even more appalling? I've heard Seventh-day Adventists saying the same thing. He's in heaven looking down on me. He's now my angel. When the Bible says when a person die, dies, even, the, even, the, even his thoughts perish. Deception I'm talking about. The sanctuary service. There are those even in our ranks who would discredit the sanctuary service as hyperbole rather than a reality. Truth of the matter is Jesus is right now on the right hand, in the throne of God, on, on the right hand of God, pleading on our behalf. That is, this is why we must take the time to study the word of God, to undo the deceptions that are in the world. 
And if we were to dis de 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 define deception, it would be the act of causing someone to accept as true what's false or invalid. There are deceivers out there. So Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. Didn't stop there. He says in verse 24 and verse 9, the last part says, and ye shall be hated of all nations. Now that's a, that, that's, that's a complete statement there. In other words, he's saying, if you are my disciples, you will be hated. You know what I pray when I leave my house in the morning, one of the prayers I pray is, Lord, please let my interactions today be pleasant. And I say it only because of this statement. That because I'm a Christian, I will say something that will get somebody upset or I will, just my mere presence may get somebody angered. So in, in, in asking God to allow my, my interactions to be pleasant, I'm saying, let me be a good rather than someone seeing me as the other. But 1 John 3 and verse 13 should resonate with you and me. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. The problem is that some of us want everybody to like us. There's nothing wrong with that. But as a Christian, that's not practical. We must at all costs live peaceably with all men. But because you and I carry the banner of Prince Emmanuel in our lives, the world will hate us. Why are we hated? We are hated because we follow Jesus, simply. As followers of Christ, we will be wrongfully criticized. And here's the reason, I'm, I'm gonna say it again. You don't have to do anything for the world to hate you. Satan hates Christ. You are named after Jesus. I tell you a, 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 a antidote. I was working with a young lady several years, many years ago. And she would ask, she would tell me that she never had a real relationship with her father. She didn't know him, in fact. But she said every time her mother is upset and she walks in to her mother's view, the mother would either punch her or tell her to get away. Here's the reason why. She looked very much like her dad. And because the girl reminded her mother of her boyfriend or her husband, that young lady, her life was miserable. Because you and I look like Jesus, our lives will remind those who are on Satan's side that we look like Jesus and they don't want us in their presence. Revelation 12 and verse 17 says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnants of her seed, those who remain, that's you and that's me, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Those are qualifying statements. We keep the commandments and we have the testimony of Jesus. That's enough for them to see us as the problem. As Christians, we will endure hardship. We will experience hardship. It seems that Christians are more likely to experience hardship than any other person on earth. It's a guarantee that we will be, have trouble in this world. Why? When we choose to, to, not to compromise the principles of God's words, the world makes the life of the Christian difficult. Imagine going to find 
employment and tell them that you don't work on Sabbath. But yet still, they, they need people to work in their office on the seventh day of the week. What's the chance that you're going to get that job? When we choose not to compromise the, 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 the principles of the word of God, the world makes our lives as Christians difficult. But 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardship as a good soldier for Christ. He used the word soldier because a soldier is someone who's trained to endure hardship. A soldier is someone who is, endure, who is trained to, 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 to remain in that hardship and still represent the country from which he or she comes. Because you and I are linked together with Christ, when we endure hardship, we do it with a smile on our faces. We do it with the sense, with a peace in our, in our hearts because we know that this is only a step towards our life with Christ. Because we can't be politically correct in this world, it will make things challenging for you and me. In fact, later on in, 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 in the history of this world, prophecy tells us that as followers of Christ, those who keep the commandments of God will neither be able to buy nor sell. You know, I, it, recently I've been having many discussions with friends and those who have different ideologies about what this pandemic means. Somebody tells me, because we don't do, if you don't do the vaccine, you can't buy or sell. It's the mark of the beast. And I'm at the point now where I'm saying, listen, don't talk to me about this virus anymore. Because if you know scripture, you know that it's because you keep the commandments of God that you will neither be able to buy nor sell at the time that the Bible, that, that prophecy will be fulfilled. So I say to you this morning, we will be hated by all men. We will have hardship. But the next thing that the, that the Christian must endure is found in James chapter 1, verses 12, and 12 to 14. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been, uh, been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let me pause there for a moment. It says, blessed are those who endure temptations. Many of us, when we are tempted, we don't endure. You know what we do? We follow along with the temptation. We don't stop and say, I'm not going to do this like Joseph. I can't do this thing and sin against God. We just flow along with the temptation. But verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. The truth about temptation is that they are there to prove our characters. They are there. They, they, we, God will not take us away from temptation. He will allow us to be tempted, but he will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. That is why when we are tempted, we should see it as a stepping stone and we should endure temptation. In other words, endure temptation means I am sticking to my principles and I'm going on the other side of this temptation as a victor. Is it easy? It certainly isn't. But I thank God that my Jesus, when he was tempted, he rebuked the tempter. And he stood firm. And we're told that he did not sin. And here's the good news. 
because he knows what you and I experience, when we are tempted, he's able, the Bible said, to succor us. That means he's able to hold us up. He's able to give us the strength that we need. He's able to give us the victory over our temptations. It's one more thing that the Christian must endure. So no matter how much we try to explain it away, it comes from within us. And here's the thing. Sin cannot reign in the same heart where God reigns. If I have Jesus in my heart, I will not sin against the God of heaven. But verse 14 says, when each, each one is tempted, when he's drawn away by his own lust, when we focus ourselves on the temptation, in, instead of the victory, then we are drawn away by our own lust. So God allows our, our, us to be tempted because it polishes our character. One victory leads to the other. Every time we are tempted and we are victorious, it makes the next temptation that much easier. As we resist temptation, we learn about ourselves. Have you ever thought, that's not my problem? I don't know what it may be. But then when you get to the point of being tempted, it tells a different story. That is why we must stay connected to Jesus. But we must also know that temptation is not sin. Temptation is just a proclivity that you and I have for a certain behavior. And it's that behavior that you and I need to get over. And each time we're tempted, it provides an opportunity for us to stand firm on the word of God. Third thing I want to say about temptation is this. There is no excuse for sinning. Now that's a hard statement to make. Because how is it that you're going to love bread so much and you don't want to eat and, and you're, you, 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 you can't stop eating bread even though you know it's going to elevate your blood sugar. And I, I, I'm saying that only because that's part of my problem. I love bread. In fact, in my conversation with, with Fred yesterday, he said he's going to make me some bread. And I said, you better. But see, the point I'm making is temptation is not sin. It is when we yield to the temptation that we, that's, that's sin, but there is no excuse for sinning. If there was, Jesus would have yielded to the temptation. But thank God he didn't. Some of us will say it's just my nature. But it's the same nature God wants to take from us. It's the same nature he wants to, to, to rid us of so that we can be fitted for heaven. That's why 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 is apropos here. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except as such as come unto man. But God is faithful. Let me pause there. When, when the Bible says God is faithful, it means that he is not, he, he will relent in everything to give us the victory. And here's the good news. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear? He didn't stop there. He said, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. You and I are not left without hope. Since Jesus came and got the victory, he is now able to give us the victory that he had when he was here on earth. So temptation is not just a pointless frustration. It can be frustrating, but it's not pointless. It is an instrument of growth and change. That's why God permits temptation. Every time we are tempted, it's an opportunity for us to improve our characters. 
Not only that, when we see a brother or a sister being tempted, you and I must be able to support such a one. Because why? We are all aiming for the same prize. Every victory is a stepping stone to greater victory, just as every defeat is an, is a, is a, is an opportunity for us to try again. God continues to allow the tests until we are victorious. It is important that no temptation is above our ability to handle. It may seem hopeless, but you can handle it. I can handle it. Why? Because Jesus is, has experienced what you and I are experiencing, and he's able to help us. Will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. Lastly, as Christians, you and I must endure persecution. Now it may seem that we're having things pretty easy now. But if if, if prophecy is worth its weight in gold, you and I, and if we live long enough, we'll, endure, we'll have to endure persecution. What is persecution? It's a hostility with ill treatment, especially because of race, politics, or religion. We don't have to look too far. In fact, right now, somewhere in our world, someone is being persecuted because of their religion. Someone is being persecuted because of their race. Somebody is being per persecuted because somebody else don't like them. Based on Paul's own experience, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 11, Paul could confidently point out that faithfulness to Christ leads to persecution. This stands in stark contrast to the prosperity gospel that we're hearing today. They're telling you, if you just put $10 in the, in the, in the plate, it will turn over to $100. Because God will bless you. But they won't tell you that if you live for Jesus, somebody will hate you. The apostles were persecuted. Paul was beheaded. Peter was hung upside down. You and I will experience, the, in fact, the, 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 the dark ages was, is telling for you and what may come for you and me. They that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Catholic Church carried out some of the most heinous persecutions in the dark age, during the Dark Ages. We're told that upwards of 60 million Christians were murdered because of their beliefs. And as depressing as it may sound, some people say, listen, come and kill me, but I love Jesus. You and I must get to the point where we love God so much and no matter what happens in this world, our faith will remain strong. We will hold on to the principles of God's words and say that we are not going to, to waver or to change because I love God so much that he will protect me. And even if he doesn't, I will still not bow. So why should we endure? We should endure because the eternity depends on it. Why should we endure? We should endure because the love of God permeates our heart and he gives us peace that passeth all understanding. Why should we endure? We should endure because soon and very soon, all of this, all of this will be just a memory for you and me. In fact, let me correct that. The Bible says the former things shall not come to mind. But Ellen White says when we look back, 
And when we take a stock of what we're experiencing in eternity, we will say heaven is cheap enough. So bring it on, I say. Bring the hatred, bring the persecution, the temptations, they are all worth it because heaven is cheap enough. So this morning, as I bring this to a close, I implore you, stay in the word of God. Stay close to Jesus because we're told that our faith can only be strengthened as we know what's in the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We can build our faith only as we know what's in God's words. That's what's on Facebook. That's what's on YouTube or on the television, but what's in the word of God. And we should build our faith because that's where we, are. We, we, we can hold on to the promises of God. We know that God says he will come and he will not tarry. But he's coming for those of us who are prepared for his soon return. So Father, we pray that you will make us faithful. You will bring us to the point where we are so firm in our decisions that we will not move to the right nor to the left, but we will stay firm. So, Father, keep us faithful. Keep us ever true. And in the end, Lord, save us in your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name.